Okay, we'll get started, folks. So, in the previous class, we were talking about central path and we were talking about how to solve a linear programming problem. So, this is my linear programming problem and I want to know how to solve this problem. And we talked about the central path approach where we have the set and this is my x star infinity and I want to get to my x star 0 by being close to this central path. And in order to compute the, like we computed some of the quantities, so I'll just write it here. So my x bar, which is the one Newton step at uh, starting from point x is is this and then I have a lambda which is a complicated expression a x squared a transpose inverse a x squared C minus <clears throat> epsilon one by x one one by x n. So these were the two quantities. This is so I'm I'm sitting at point x. I'm sitting at point x, this is the central path, this is my x star epsilon and I take one Newton step and I get to x bar which is very close to x star epsilon and the question now is how do we figure out whether we should continue with our iteration, our, our Newton step or should we change the value of epsilon and then restart the iteration because we know from our experience that in order to get to x star epsilon I need to run infinite number of iterations and we don't have that much time and we are happy with an approximate solution we don't really need a very accurate solution. So this was where we left last time. The other thing we learned in the previous class is I can look at this Q of X epsilon, I can rewrite it and it turns out to be equal to X inverse X minus X bar. And so what we had discussed in the previous class by rewriting this particular expression, I can compute the value of Q. It's well known, I know X, I know X bar, I know capital X which is diagonal, uh, a diagonal matrix with elements being uh, entries of X. So I can actually compute this vector and what we had also discussed is if Q is equal to zero, then it means x is equal to x bar which will only happen at the optimal point. So what that meant is if q is small then it means that x and x bar are very close to each other. What that means is x bar is very close to x star epsilon. Okay, so these were the things we discussed in the previous class. Now let's see if we can exploit this information to come up with the algorithm. So I'm going to write a few results. Let me write it as lemma one. So if x is greater than zero, ax is equal to b and q of x epsilon non is less than one.
Yeah. Then C transpose X minus F star. So F star is the optimal value. Is less than or equal to C transpose X minus B transpose lambda, which is less than or equal to So I have picked my epsilon and I have picked my x such that, or I have run some Newton's iteration, I have reached this point x such that x is strictly positive, x lies on the manifold ax equal to b, and the norm of q turns out to be less than 1, strictly less than 1. Then in that case, this is the optimality gap. So I'm currently sitting at x and I have C transpose x is the current cost. F star is the optimal cost, so I'm looking at the optimality gap, which is C transpose x minus F star. I'm looking at it. It turns out that it is less than or equal to epsilon, which is a parameter that I have picked, times n plus square root of n. Okay. So as I make epsilon smaller and smaller, I am getting closer and closer to the optimal solution, right? That's what the purpose of this particular lemma is. But in order for that to be true, I need my x to be greater than 0, ax to be equal to b, and the norm of q should be less than 1. Those are the three conditions that x and epsilon needs to satisfy in order for that result to hold true. Okay, so this is a condition we will use to stop our iterations because as soon as we are within the desired range of the optimal solution, we will stop the iteration. So this will give us the stopping criterion for our optimization problem. Okay. So we have a stopping criterion. Now let's try to figure out uh, what happens to the value of Q, the norm of Q, when I go from X to X bar? So that is my lemma two, okay? So in lemma two, so remember norm of Q tells me how close I am to the central path. So I want to know what happens to norm of Q when I'm at X versus when I'm at X bar, okay? So if x is greater than 0, ax equal to b norm of q of x epsilon less than 1, then q of x bar epsilon norm is less than or equal to q of x epsilon square. Oh, I must also write that then x bar is strictly greater than zero and there was a question. Can you just repeat the second one? The second one? Yeah, like, yeah, that's to be. Oh, so what I'm what I'm saying there is Q is a measure of distance between how close this point is to the central path. So what lemma 2 is trying to tell us is how close is x bar to the central path. So we know how close is x to the central path. We don't know how close is x bar to the central path. 
So this lemma allows us to estimate that. Okay? But it's actually giving us two results. The first result it's saying is x bar is strictly positive, okay, which is something we needed. And the second thing is q of x bar epsilon is less than q square. But remember, this q is less than 1. So the square of a quantity that is less than 1 is actually very small. Yes, please. You said uh, the C transpose X minus F star, that's our stopping criteria, right? Right. But how do we know F star? Are we trying to find the X that gets us F star? Uh, you are trying to find the X that gives us F star, that's right. But this is a theory result. In theory, we know what F star is. And so, but we know that this is less than or equal to something that I can readily observe by looking at the code. Right? So, So that allows us to come up with a stopping criterion. Okay. Okay. So any questions on the second lemma? The second lemma is saying that if these conditions are satisfied, then the Newton iterate, the first Newton iterate is also going to be positive. So all the entries are going to be positive number. And it's going to be very close to the central path. How close to the central path? Well, the norm of Q is less than or equal to norm of Q at x square. OK. So we have the stopping criterion. We understand how close x bar is to the central path. Now we need to figure out how to change the value of epsilon. And that is lemma 3. And so lemma 3 also goes in the same way. If x is greater than 0, ax equal to b, and norm of q of x epsilon is less than or equal to gamma, which is strictly less than 1, then then I'm going to pick delta. This is a complicated expression. I don't want to screw it up. So let me just write it. So delta equals to gamma times 1 minus gamma over 1 plus gamma less than or equal to pick epsilon bar to be 1 minus delta over square root of n epsilon. If x, if these hypothesis is satisfied, I'm going to pick this number, then norm of q x bar epsilon bar is less than or equal to gamma. OK, so here is what we have. Suppose these conditions are satisfied, and we all know that these conditions are required in all of the above lemmas. So if these conditions are satisfied, I'm going to pick a delta according to this fashion. I'm going to pick an epsilon bar, which is 
1 minus delta over square root of n times epsilon. So remember, delta is a positive number. I'm dividing it by square root of n, subtracting it by 1. So this is some, a number which is strictly less than 1. <coughs> and I have this epsilon from the previous iteration. Then it turns out that q of x bar epsilon bar is also less than equal to gamma. So this was the gamma here that I started with. And I have the same gamma here <coughs> for x bar and epsilon bar. So here is what the pictorial meaning of this particular uh, lemma is. So this is my x star of 0. That's the optimal solution. I am sitting here. This is my x. This is my x star of epsilon. And I'm saying that my norm of q is less than or equal to gamma, which means that x is close to x star epsilon, okay? Because my q, norm of q is less than 1. So whenever norm of q is less than 1, it means that I'm close to the central path. x is close to the central path. I take one Newton step and I reach here. This is my x bar. And I'm going to reduce the value of epsilon according to this fashion. So I reduce the value of epsilon, and so my point in the central path has now moved to this point. This is my x star epsilon bar. <clears throat> and what this lemma is saying that, hey, look, the norm of q of x bar epsilon bar is also less than or equal to gamma, which is strictly less than 1. What that means is if this particular distance is small, then this distance is also going to be small. Okay? And this is the crucial lemma that allows us to derive the algorithm. Okay? This one is not that important. This one is basically saying, that I'm close to the central path after taking one Newton step. It's good to know, but not that important. This one gives us an iterative method to approximately follow the central path. And this lemma gives us the stopping criterion for stopping the iteration when the desired accuracy is reached. So here is how we will start the algorithm. Uh, here is how this algorithm is typically run. Okay, any questions so far before I, yes, please. Gamma is just some number less than one. Gamma is some number less than one, and we want our Q of X epsilon to be less than or equal to gamma. Yes, please. Does gamma change like for each iteration, or is it constant the whole time? Uh, you would not want to change it in each iteration. But, uh, so there is a difference between how it's actually implemented and what the theory suggests. Okay, so we'll go over that in a bit. Any other question? So, and the first lemma will be satisfied, which means that we have raised x star of 0 or closer to 0? Well, lemma 1 will always be satisfied. But the accuracy of x depends on the value of epsilon that you have at that moment. Okay. So remember, you start with a large value of epsilon, and then you start reducing the value of epsilon. OK? So initially, let's say epsilon equals to 10. Then this is actually a large number, which is sort of absurd. Okay, so here is how we will start the iteration. So first, we need to satisfy this criterion, okay? So here is how to do it. I'm going to erase this part. So I have a hyperplane, AX equal to B. I start with some x naught, which is strictly greater than 0. And I'm going to project it onto the plane such that this particular point, well, I shouldn't write x naught. Let me say y. So y is my initial point, which is strictly greater than 0. I project it onto ax equals to b. And I want to make sure that this point x naught is strictly greater than 0. 
Okay, so this is the way, this, through this projection, so if x0 was, if one of the elements of x0 is less than zero, you have to discard that point y and you have to restart again. You have to come up with a new y so that your x0, which is the projection of y onto this plane, is strictly greater than zero. So all the elements have to be greater than zero. So now you have a point x0, which is strictly greater than zero after doing a few uh, trials. You get a point that has all elements strictly greater than zero, and it lies on this plane, ax equal to b. OK. <clears throat> now this is the central path. This is my x star 0, and this is my x star infinity. And I'm sitting at some point x0, which is within this uh, plane. And I have picked some epsilon naught according to my favorite number, so let's say epsilon naught equals to 10. OK. What am I supposed to do now? My goal, so right now I'm very far away from the central path. My goal is to get closer to the central path. So I'm going to pick some gamma equals to 0 0.9 or 0 0.8, whatever is my favorite number less than 1. So. I have picked my epsilon naught, I have picked some gamma, which is the tolerance used here for norm of Q. So I have picked some gamma, and I am sitting at x naught, and I need to get closer to the central path. What am I supposed to do? I am supposed to run a few Newton's iteration, right? So I run a few Newton's iteration, and I will reach here, which is Let me call this, I, I don't want to call it x0, but technically that would be x0 also. OK, anyways, I run a few Newton's iteration. Let me call it x, uh, should I call it x1? I'm trying to think whether I should call it x1 or x0. OK, let, let me call it x1. And I know that this is my x star of 10, or x star of epsilon naught. <clears throat> no, I don't like it. OK, I'll change the notation a little bit. So this is my x tilde, and this is my x0. So I've reached a point such that norm of Q of x0 epsilon naught is less than or equal to gamma. So I ran the Newton's iteration until I'm satisfying this criterion. My Q of x0 epsilon naught is less than gamma, which means that this x0 is close to x star epsilon naught. OK, now what do we do? What should be the next step? We will update epsilon. Sorry? We will update epsilon. We will update epsilon according to lemma 3, right? Or there is a, another step that I need to do before I update my epsilon. Sorry? Pick delta. Pick del delta. No, even before that, I need to do something else. So here is what I need to do. I need to take a Newton step from x0 and get at x bar naught. So this would be my x bar naught. So that's my x bar naught. And I now have, I have to, then I have to change epsilon. And then I will pick epsilon 1. F, then compute compute uh, x bar 0, then pick epsilon 1 using lemma 3. So I pick epsilon 1, and this is my x star epsilon 1. OK, now what do I do? Now I'm going to set my x1 to be x bar 0. 
my next iterate will start exactly at this point, x bar 0. And I'm going to take one Newton step. So this is my equal to x1. I'll take one Newton step, and I will reach here. And this point is x bar 1, which will become x2. OK, and then compute x bar 1, which is equal to x2, and then continue reducing the value of epsilon. And this is the iteration that we will take. So x0 to x1, x1 to x2, then x3, then x4, then x5, and so on. And in each step, I'm reducing the value of epsilon in order to take the next iteration. OK? So this is the uh, famous Karmakas algorithm for solving linear programming problem. And what's nice here is after you take a few Newton's iteration in the beginning to get close to the central path, you are taking one Newton step, changing the value of epsilon, then taking one Newton step, then changing the value of epsilon, and taking one Newton step, and so on. Now, the complexity of one Newton step is fairly straightforward. You have to compute x lambda, and then you have to compute x0. The conditions to check is also fairly straightforward. You have to compute Q of x epsilon, and so computing the norm is not really a big deal. Okay, so Q of x epsilon is something that you compute. You can always compute the norm. And then the choice of epsilon bar, which is the way to update epsilon, is also very straightforward. You, not a lot of calculation involved here in this whole process. So in this case, for this particular algorithm, you can actually specify uh, how many iterations you need to take in order to reach a certain tolerance level. You can actually specify it exactly. So you will need, if you want to get to within 10 raised to minus 6 of f star, you need to take 2,000 iterations of this particular algorithm. You can specify that. And which is why this algorithm has the best worst case performance. So I give it the worst linear programming problem that I can come up with. This will give me the best performance among all possible algorithms for solving linear programming that we knew at, in 1984 at that time. This had the best performance in the worst case. So that's, that's the most important thing. Now, you may be solving linear programming in the context of a supply chain problem, or you may be solving linear programming for an electricity market problem, and so on. You may not be solving the worst possible linear programming problem. OK? So, so maybe simplex method would do very well in that problem. Uh, but this algorithm is supposed to be the best algorithm for the worst linear programming problem that could be given to you. And that's the theoretical uh, justification for why this algorithm is superior. It's, it has the best worst case performance. Uh, yes? When would I know when to start? So you are reducing the value of epsilon at every step, right? So you started with some epsilon naught. You are always multiplying it with 1 minus delta over square root of n, where delta is given by some expression that depends on gamma. So in order to get 10 raised to minus 6 closer to f star, you want your epsilon to be 10 raised to minus 6 over n plus square root of n. OK, let's see how many iterations you need. OK? Let's do the calculation. So let's say the tolerance is 10 raised to minus 6. So I want my C transpose x minus f star to be less than or equal to 10 raised to minus 6. This implies that my epsilon should be less than or equal to 10 raised to minus 6 over n plus square root of n. 
Now when will, so now we know that epsilon k plus 1 is 1 minus delta over square root of n epsilon k or raised to k epsilon 0. Maybe I should write epsilon k equals to this. So I want my epsilon to be less than some small number. And I have a geometrically decreasing value of epsilon. So how long, what's the value of k at which I'm going to reach a number which is below this? How do we compute that? Anyone has an idea how do I know at what k the value of epsilon k will be less than this particular number? No? Let's do that calculation. Log. Yeah, log is the right answer, but log of what? So I want k to be greater than equal to log of 10 raised to minus 6 over n plus square root of n over log of epsilon naught. No. Uh, log of 1 minus delta over square root of n and I need to multiply epsilon naught here. So if I pick a value of k which is greater than this number, all of which is known, epsilon naught is known, n is known, square root of n is known, delta is known from here. So I know all of these numbers, I can figure out how many iterations I need so that my epsilon k is less than this particular number. Does that make sense? So we know exactly how many iterations are needed for solving this problem up to a given tolerance level. Isn't that amazing? For simplex method, we couldn't have come up with this, this uh, number of iterations approach because it really depends on where you started from. In this case, it depends on where you start from, but you are applying Newton's iteration, so you will converse to the central path very, very quickly. And once you, con once you are close to the central path, then you exactly know how many iterations you need in order to get to the optimal solution within a certain tolerance level. <clears throat> OK. Now here is a simplification. So this was a question that was asked several times. If I reduce the value of, so remember, this depends on how quickly, so number of iterations actually depend on how quickly you can reduce the value of epsilon. Now, in this case, I'm reducing the value of epsilon by a factor of one minus delta over square root of n. And this factor is very large because delta has to be smaller than some quantity that depends on gamma. Uh, this is very small factor. I would like to have a larger factor here. I want to reduce the value of epsilon at every iterate at a much faster rate. So if I started with epsilon naught equals to 10, and this lemma suggests that my epsilon 1 should be equal to 9, I don't want my epsilon 1 to be 9. I want my epsilon 1 to be 5, or I want my epsilon 1 to be 1. Then what do we do? Then what's going to happen? Let me redraw this. Let me redraw the diagram. So this is my central path. This is my x star of 0. This is my x star of infinity. And this is my x0. And I have picked my epsilon. So this is my x star of epsilon 0. And I have picked epsilon 1 to be very small. And this is my x star of epsilon 1, where epsilon 1 is 0 0.2 
times epsilon naught. So I picked a very small factor. I'm not sticking to this schedule, which is given to me by the algorithm designer. Now, how do I get close to x star epsilon 1? Yeah. Take several Newton steps, step, right? So initially, here, we took only one Newton step and then changed the value of epsilon. Here, we cannot take one Newton step, so I'll have to take several Newton steps. And then I reach my x1. And then I'll change the value of epsilon, and then I'll take several Newton steps to get to x2. The problem with this approach is I cannot estimate how many Newton steps I need to take. And that's the only problem. That's literally the only problem with this approach. However, this approach reduces the value of epsilon much faster. So in practice, in theory, that algorithm is good. In practice, this algorithm is good. Okay? So you want to reduce the value of epsilon at a much faster rate and then take several Newton steps. The only problem is I cannot compute how many iterations I need to take to get to the optimal solution. But that's fine. I can always, uh, I know that C transpose X minus F star is less than or equal to epsilon times N plus square root of N. So I can still stop when this criterion would be met, but but the number of iterations I need to take is sort of unknown in that situation. Yes, please. What do you do after you get x1? Do you do the same thing? Yeah, you just, yeah, you reduce the value of epsilon. And then you take several Newton step. But you are reducing the value of epsilon very quickly. Like, this multiplication factor is very small in comparison to what the theory suggests we should take. Any questions on this one? So I always joke, if you are a PhD student, you should use this algorithm. If you are a master's student, you should use this algorithm. Because in master's degree, you don't care about the theoretical performance. In PhD, you have to care about the theoretical performance. So you want to use this algorithm because you can exactly specify the performance of this algorithm over multiple steps. OK. No questions? Uh, when we are taking multiple Newton steps, how is it going to traverse this line? Because uh, I am going to take, for example, one Newton step, mm -hmm. stop when my x bar is very close to XR right. So it will get closer and closer to the previous XR epsilon not to the next <coughs> No, uh, so when I reach close to, so when my Q of X naught epsilon naught norm is less than 0 0.8, I'm going to change the epsilon 1 to 0 0.2 times epsilon naught. Right, so I'm close to, X naught is close to X star. I change the value of epsilon and I make it epsilon 1. Now I have to get to this point, and so I have to take multiple Newton step to get there. So I have to take multiple Newton step until Q of x1 epsilon 1 is less than 0 .0, 0 0.8. Right? So, so that's how I'm checking whether I'm close to the central path, and if I am, then I'll just uh, change the value of epsilon. If I'm far away, I'll continue taking steps Newton step until I get closer. Any other question?
okay so that was a this is a barrier method for solving linear programming problem. We have used the logarithmic barrier function to come up with f epsilon. So we use log barrier function to come up with f epsilon x. And then we took Newton's iteration to solve this particular uh, minimization problem over the manifold ax equal to b. And that algorithm turns out to be this following the central path. And what we have discussed so far is how do you converse to the optimal solution following the central path, like staying close to the central path. Now the next step in the next algorithm, which is uh, uh, using what is known as augmented Lagrangian method, uh, we are going to talk about equality constraint problems and how to solve equality constraint problem using what is known as an augmented Lagrangian. So let's talk about that. Okay. Augmented Lagrangian. method. So here is the problem. I want to minimize f of x such that h of x equal to 0 and x is in Rn. Oh, x is not in Rn, but x is in capital X. Yes, please. I have, a, I have a question about the barrier functions. Yes. When, like, is there ever a time that you would want to use like the inverse barrier function that you showed us? Uh, right. So remember, we talked about a fine scaling method. Uh, so a fine scaling method is similar to using inverse barrier function instead of logarithmic barrier function. Yeah. <coughs> now, now here is the thing. Uh, Logarithmic and inverse barrier functions have been widely used in solving problems, but you can come up with your own barrier function as long as you can show that the performance is better than the existing barrier functions. Probably not, but you can maybe spend the next 10, 10 years of your life trying to figure out that barrier function, which could get you a better performance. Okay, so this is my problem. I want to solve this problem. What do I know about, so let's consider x to be Rn. Then I know a very cool thing, which is the Lagrange multiplier theorem, which basically says uh, I can construct the Lagrangian to be f of x plus lambda transpose h of x. And the Lagrange multiplier theory says that gradient of x at x star and lambda star is equal to 0. But there is a problem. If you want to compute x star, so we don't know lambda star, right? So lambda star is something that, if you look at the problem, there is no way for you to know what value of lambda star is. You actually want to solve it in order to get the value of lambda star. But let's, for the argument's sake, God comes and tells you what lambda star for the problem you are interested in solving is. So somebody gave you this lambda star. Then, then the only problem you have to solve is compute an x such that the first order necessary conditions for optimality is true. But there is a problem with that approach. 
all we know is that the gradient is equal to zero, but we don't quite know whether by running a gradient descent algorithm, I'll be able to reach this stationary point. And that's because if you look at the Lagrangian as a function of x around x star, it need not have a shape of this type. It will not have a shape of this type. It may have a shape of this type. So this is my x star. And this is my L of x lambda star. This is my, well, yeah. So I could have any of these, shape, these shapes. So what would be ideal is if I could transform the Lagrangian in such a way that even if the original Lagrangian looks like this, the new Lagrangian would have a shape that looks like this. So then I can run a gradient descent algorithm over the Lagrangian for a given lambda star that was given to me by God. I could run the gradient descent algorithm and I can converse to this x star that satisfies the first order necessary condition for optimality. So in order to do that, what we need to do is augment the Lagrangian with something else. And let me tell you what that something else is. This is known as augmented Lagrangian. And this is given by LC of x lambda which is a term that you have seen before and here I'm picking C sufficiently large. Okay. So by adding this term with C sufficiently large and I have added this norm of HX square to the Lagrangian, what I get is an augmented Lagrangian and the augmented, so this is the original Lagrangian L of X lambda star looks like this. But LC of X lambda star will always look like this. So it will always have a shape such that x star is a minimum point of the augmented Lagrangian, which, is a, which satisfies the first order necessary conditions for optimality. And that's the beauty of augmented Lagrangian. Why this happens, uh, there is a very long derivation in the book about why this would happen, but you can take my word for it that by adding c sufficiently large, and by multiplying this term by norm of hx square, you can create a curvature in the augmented Lagrangian space such that x, is a, x star is a minimum point of the augmented Lagrangian. And now, if you solve this problem, minimize LC of x lambda star, x in Rn, what you will get is x star, which satisfies the first order necessary condition for optimality. This is not the optimal solution. This is the solution that satisfies f, o, n, c. OK, questions? Yes, please. Does this work for like any kind of curvature, like augmenting into that term? Yes, it would. 
So as long as it satisfies the regularity, so remember that it, x star is optimal and regular, then all the Lagrange multiplier conditions were satisfied. So we just need this x star to be a regular point, in which case that will, there will be a curvature, uh, a positive curvature, and x star would be the minimum point. Any other question? Okay. Now here is the problem. So of course, if, if God gave me lambda star, I can do this minimization problem using Newton's method or whatever, whatever your favorite method is, gradient descent, steepest descent, Newton's method, LBFGS method or BFGS method. You can use any of that method to solve this minimization problem and get a point which is, satisfies the first order necessary conditions for optimality. The problem is, I don't know what lambda star is. Uh, actually, I shouldn't say there is no God. Uh, but, but who is going to give me this lambda star? Okay? Who is going to give me this lambda star? I don't have the value of lambda star. And I want to... Uh, this is the minimization problem that I need to solve without knowing the value of lambda star. So what do I do? So here are some ideas that we can try. So, so let's do some, let me give you some theorem. So let's say I have picked CK, I have picked lambda K that goes to lambda bar. This is some, so I've picked lambda K, a sequence which goes to lambda bar and this lambda bar is arbitrary. I don't know what this lambda bar does. I have CK that, that is less than CK plus one and CK goes to infinity. CK goes to infinity. So I'm, I'm increasing the value of CK uh, that goes all the way to infinity. So CK is, uh, is increasing. And I define my XK to be the argument of LCK X lambda K. X is an Rn. So at every point of time, I'm minimizing this augmented Lagrangian term. Okay, so if xk converges to x bar, then x bar is global minimum. So if my algorithm converges, then the limit point is going to be a global minimum. Now the problem with this approach is you should be able to compute the argument of this augmented Lagrangian term. And that is typically the reason, like if you have a non-convex problem, you won't be, you can only compute local minimum, you can't compute the global minimum of LCK. And therefore, uh, X bar will only satisfy the stationary condition, but it may not be the global minimum. So that's just the difference between theory and reality. In reality, you can't compute the argument, you can only compute a local minimum of the augmented Lagrangian. In which case, this X bar would be a stationary point of the original problem. Okay, any questions on this result? So if I look at LC, so my LC as a function of X would look something like this. one of which would be the optimal solution 
and there will be a lot of local minima in this graph of LC and depending on where you started whatever your x naught was you may converse to one of these points or you could converse to the globally optimal solution. Now of course in this case it's automatically assuming that you are converging to the globally optimal solution in which case the limit point is going to be a global minimum. In reality we will never be at this point all the time. We could converge to this point or this point or this point in which case we will be at a stationary point. Okay. So that's all I have. Oh, you have a question? No? Okay. So that's all I have for today. Uh, in the next class, we'll talk about uh, a method of multipliers which allows us to update lambda k in a specific way and ck in a specific way so that we converse to a stationary point of the problem. So we'll talk about it in the next class. Thank you.